specifically talk about cardiac regeneration. And that's always been considered the holy grail of most organ regeneration. But as it is so complex, and it's basically been being worked on for about 20 years with very limited results. And there's very good reasons. And from our last speaker, we were able to hear a lot of the mechanistics and biological reasons why many of these therapies have failed from rapid translation. So this is now like almost 15 plus years old where they magically thought if we got cell bone marrow cells, we put them in the heart, heart's gonna get better. There's some truth to that, that certain parts of the heart will get better with depending on which type of bone marrow cell, whether it's a CD34, an angiogenic progenitor, a MSC, or other cells like that. But the key is defining what part of the heart are you really trying to regenerate. So basic things about the heart, pumps 8,000 liters a day, but the most important thing, as opposed to the liver, the skin, GI tract, only 0.3 to 1% cell turnover per year. Because there's so much cell senescence, most of these biological therapies are really ineffective. So even if you could transfect a cardiac cell, unless you're pushing it back into an aggressive cell cycle, you may get transfection, but you're not gonna get functional replication, division, or hypertrophy. Same thing with cardiac progenitors. There are many different cardiac progenitors that have been identified in the heart and whether you use them as patches and other routes of delivery, very limited results because most of the cells that you put in a heart, only about 2% actually survive within 24 hours. When you put it in a patch or a gel, you can get up to 30% at about 30 days. But after that, your immune system takes over, and even if they're self cells or autologous, most of them are destroyed. So that's when you look at a lot of the hostile environments, especially with the heart, because the most common thing we're treating is ischemic heart disease. As we heard from our prior speaker, that everything looks very pretty in a dish, and it looks great in small animals. But in real patients, most of these biologics don't actually survive to have a therapeutic effect. So when you look at many of these regenerative therapies, and I'll talk about cells, genes, and many other things, that it makes it very difficult to see the true benefit. So let's look at the most basic part that we've really misunderstood for 20 years, is what are we actually trying to regenerate? So everyone thought, well, if we just make more cardiac myocytes, that's going to be the answer. And so if you look at most of the most complex therapies such as the IPS, ES, cell sheets, you're basically making cardiac myocytes or progenitors. But the problem is only 25 to 35% of the heart is actual myocytes. You have up to 75% that includes all these other things, immune cells, small amount of fibroblasts. If you could believe this, up until five years ago, they didn't actually know there were only about 20% fibroblasts in the heart. There's actually papers that are less than five years old that thought there was up to 60% of the heart still had cardiac fibroblasts. So when you look at reprogramming-based therapies, which I'll discuss, if you're reprogramming cardiac fibroblasts and you only have an efficiency of about 10 to 15% and it's less than 30% of the cells, that's still not a lot of cells to actually see a functional improvement, let alone a clinically meaningful improvement. So even though the science in a dish looks great, it's really defining what are the different cell types that we're trying to affect. So majority of the cells are actually endothelial cells lining the vasculature, both on the arterial side and the venous side. And that's one of the most important targets for many of these regenerative-based approaches. So our most basic problem is when all of these cells, when people get heart attacks and also viral and other approaches, we end up with a lot of patients, 25 million patients with heart failure, 5 million in the U.S., one in nine deaths, and we have very limited approaches. We heard from our prior speaker about LVADs as a bridge to transplant or as a permanent therapy, but that's still very expensive, and I've been putting LVADs in for 20 years, and the same complications that existed 20 years ago, even with the evolution of technology, are still there, which is bleeding, thrombosis, infection. We've come up with better pumps, smaller pumps, but you trade one new complication for a different one. So as the pumps get smaller, for all the immunology people, we actually now get acquired von Billebrands in up to 40% of LVAD patients by using small continuous flow pumps. So as technology advances, we still are limited in helping our end stage patients. So a biological approach is still very realistic, even though we have advanced device therapy,
that is FDA approved. So our most fundamental problem of regenerative therapies is still for what are we trying to regenerate? So if we just make new myocytes, in most cases, that's not going to help the patients because that's not their only underlying disease, that during a heart attack, they lost myocytes. We really need to look at the angiogenic component. How can we improve cell homing, whether it's endogenous within the heart or systemic? Energetics. We have dysfunctional mitochondria as we get older from the lipid disorders and inflammation. We have scar remodeling. After a heart attack, all the matrix from the decellularized lungs you saw in the last slides, those are dysfunctional. So if you're trying to use that as your scaffold and homing signals for new organs, it really doesn't work. It looks pretty in a dish, but you don't get functional contractile tissue. And what the most important one we're finding is the immunomodulation. So end-stage heart failure patients are in such a inf high inflammatory state that depending on any biologic you put, most of them are destroyed by the innate immune system just because of the high inflammatory response. So when you're defining a cardiac regenerative therapy, you need to look at more than one of these approaches to likely to have success. And up until now, most of the approaches have been either a single cell or a single gene approach. So if you only target one of these, the body's smart enough that it will upregulate the other pathways, and that's why most of these therapies have failed. So when we look at our basic options for heart failure, lots of medications. The first real medication to get improved, uh, Sagubitril or Entresto last year, first heart failure therapy approved as a drug in like 20 years. It did have a clinical meaningful benefit to them, but very limited. Invasive devices, the LVADs, and of course heart transplant, which we still have very limited. The key for using heart transplants, not only for the clinical use, but also the organs that we can't always transplant, those we can actually put in as heterotropic. And we've done this way back in the old days. You almost piggyback it on the failing heart for a salvage patient, and you still can see benefit. But those are the organs that you can actually use scaffold and recellularize and things like that because those patients are fully anticoagulated. So when we look at the biological approaches to this, we have all the cell-based approaches and gene-based approaches. And with cells, there are so many different mechanisms that people have proposed, but there's not a one defined mechanism that works well because from dish to animal to human, depending on the surrounding environment, depends on how that cell is going to function, of what secreted factors, how long it will survive, which most of them all die within 30 days or less. So you don't have a defined always mechanism. So when you're trying to put this into clinical trials, unless you have similar groups of patients, based on your preclinical data, you don't always see the same effect. The other big problem in cell-based therapies has been you take a 25-gram mouse, you put a million cells in, it looks wonderful. To scale that to a 70-kilo patient is 2 to 4 billion cells. Well, currently, there's only five trials out of the 3,600 that are on clinicaltrials.gov that actually scale dosing to an effective dose that might actually be meaningful. So it's some of the more simple things, not the complex biology. In gene-based approaches, that would have been around for 20 plus years, most of the gene-based approaches have been a single gene approach with a viral or even pDNA delivery. Most of the viral-based approaches have great transfection rates. The problem is the patient's own immune system either has preformed antibodies or wipes it out after it's been delivered through T cells, and you can't get redosing. As opposed to more of these single gene disorders, most heart failure is a chronic condition. So expecting a single dose biologic to ever cure these patients is completely unrealistic. So redosing has to be part of the strategy because if you form antibodies either to your donor MSCs or to your viral-based products, you have no other options after the one hit. And most of these patients you'll see within six months to a year, if you see the clinical benefit, usually will start trending back down because you still have progression of disease. And that's one of the fundamental issues with cardiac regeneration, that redosing has to be part of your thought process. And this slide is complex, but these are all the different cell types, from adipose, bone marrow, cardiac progenitors. So every subpopulation under the sun, including cord, aloe, autologous, has been tried in the heart in clinical trials. But if you look at it, 
out of all of these trials, there are only five ever that are published that are randomized, blinded, prospective, greater than 100 patients where you can actually see a clinical meaningful benefit. Clinically meaningful means either you reduced mortality, reduced heart failure admissions, the same benchmark that you would use for a standard pharma approval. Only five trials ever. So that's a very limited number, and most of them that work that way all use the multi-hit approach. And that's one of the key things is, so this approach where you actually take more than one cell type together. So this was taking a bone marrow sample and expanding MSCs and M2 macrophages. So now you have multiple mechanisms working at the same time in a end-stage patient population. Randomized, blinded trial, primary endpoint, mortality, hospitalization, ischemic heart failure. So patients who have heart attacks, low ejection fraction. In this case, normal is 60. These patients were less than 30. So these were populations that would most likely qualify for an LVAD. At one year, we were able to show a 30% reduction in death and heart failure readmissions. But it's a very complex process. So prospective randomized placebo control trial was successful. The downside is it's a corporate trial and the group that funded this, even though this data was positive, had a competing orthopedic program, which they've decided to stick with orthopedics. And so even though successful trial just hasn't progressed to phase three, even though clinical benefit, all the benchmarks, but it's a very complex culture process. That's the other thing, is the cost of some of these products becomes prohibitive to actually make a therapy that is ever going to get reimbursed. When we look at the pluripotent cells, which are the other approaches, whether you're taking the ES or IPS, you have to make them into not only the cells, the fibroblasts, you put this combination together, and these have not been translated into patients, but as you're trying to translate them from these small to larger animals, the most fundamental problem for ES and IPS has been your immune system, more than anything else, is if you can make the pure sorted populations, is even if you do a self-IPS, you lose your self signals. So your MHC class one and two changes enough that your immune system still attacks your cells. So you still have to immunosuppress patients, whether you're doing an ES-based approach, which there's now uh, one trial that has been completed in France. Uh, IPS has not been uh, really initiated here or in Japan, but they're hoping in the next year to do that. But the immune system's the most fundamental problem when you're using it, any one of these more advanced or designer-based cells. So because of that, as we heard from the last speaker, the most common cell that's been used in most cardiac cell therapies has been a mesenchymal cell in one form or another. Most of them being bone marrow. Currently, there is a phase three trial in the US for heart failure. It's a little over 500 patients. They're about three quarters of the way enrolled. There's been adipose, umbilical cord, many of them. But one of the unique things that I saw uh, from the last speaker's slides, and maybe our next speaker can explain better since they know MSCs. Most MSCs, when they say they're HLA-DR low or no, when you actually do quantitative flow, most commercial cells that are out there, and even academics, and we've looked at 26 different products, have exp HLA-DR expression between 10 and 20%. So they still qualify as low, but they're really not low in the true sense. And that has a huge impact on survival and also how the host is going to treat these allo cells. And so there are trials when you look at it, you see donor-specific antibodies that arise in patients, and you actually look at PRA or panel reactive antibodies, which we use for all heart transplants and other organ transplants that do elevate in patients who have received allo MSCs, even if they're transient. And a lot has to do with both the culture techniques, be it whether it's xeno-free or also the cell type. So as we all know, not all MSCs are the same, but in cardiac, that has had a huge impact in some of the clinical endpoints. So everyone shows that you can have a little bit of ejection fraction improvement, it's safe. Those things have been well documented now. But again, in terms of clinically meaningful effect or any actual true regeneration, very little. You do get some great scar remodeling. That's probably the most reliable thing that has been reproduced by many groups is looking at cardiac MRI, both preclinical and clinical, and you do see with MSC-based therapy that there is a remodeling. 
But in terms of true cardiac myocytes, unfortunately, some people interpret those MRIs as a regeneration of myocytes because they're scar reduction, so the actual myocardial mass looks like it's increased, but mostly it's all scar remodeling. So what we had done, and this is from what our group and a number of other teams, we looked at all the different MSCs that are out there and said, how do we improve on them? We're both at the immunological level, size level, delivery, and growth. So we actually looked at cord lining. Many people have used Wharton's jelly. We actually looked at the subepithelial layer and then actually derived it in a hypoxic environment so we could actually upregulate a lot of the different genes that are more likely to help in terms of survival and actually mimic what the real environment is. So whether we're putting it in the heart, lung, or other organs, it's a pretty hostile environment. So if we can actually grow these cells in a hostile environment in vitro, it's more likely to mimic what they're going to see in vivo, and we actually see much better effect of it. We also see that our HLA-DR levels are around two. So there's about three or four groups now that have this sub-5% uh, HLA-DR or immune reaction. So smaller cells, they grow better, xenofree. And so this has become a trend we're seeing, but we're also seeing clinical use of these cells that is actually becoming more meaningful than what we've previously seen. Our approach of using this in the cardiac model is actually through the coronary sinus. So this is the venous system of the heart, so really addressing the endothelium. There's no damage, but as you can see, this is contrast going in through the left ventricle. We can marinate the entire left ventricle. This is done as an outpatient procedure. Patients awake during this, it takes about 20 minutes. And the key is we still have anti-grade flow in the heart, so this creates a pressure column so this actually pushes all the cells right into the interstitium and towards the myocardial cells. And so this actually effectively gives us a better treatment effect, and not only with those cells, but we've done this with cells, genes, and actually drugs. And so this approach actually helps us in the delivery of a lot of these regenerative therapies. We've actually done a dose escalation trial using those cells and actually found that we can actually give 400 million cells with no toxicity. And therapeutic, at least, signal is about two to 400. So you do need a higher dose retrograde because you are marinating the entire heart. We've had other groups do this with bone marrow-based cells, MSCs from different sources, from adipose. And we're actually seeing for a lot of these next generation regenerative therapies where you're trying to treat the entire heart that you really need to be able to marinate it. And that's the only way you can get these therapies to where you really want them to go. The other unique approach of cells is, and there's been very little data, this is from our group a long time ago, of using brown adipose progenitors, or brown fat. And the reason for that is one of our fundamental dysfunctions in the myocardium is energy or mitochondria. So many people have used calcium signaling or enhancing calcium uh, channels to improve contractility. Well, brown fat progenitors actually improve metabolism naturally. We see that in little kids. You could eat whatever you want. You don't gain weight as you get older and transition to white fat. So these brown fat progenitors, when we actually put them with cardiac myocytes, actually improve contractility. And so another cell-based approach looking mechanistically at how you can actually help regenerate. So when we look at the cell-free based approaches, we have exosomes, which uh, our group and many have posters here, uh, drugs and genes, so most recently, the key is that 0.3 to 1% of cell cycle activation, or basically senescence that we see in cardiac myocytes, using uh, cyclin-dependent kinases, using these cocktails of drugs now, and this has actually been published just a couple of months ago, you can actually see significant improvement in scar reduction. So there's a number of groups doing this, where you actually use, instead of the three to four genes to reprogram, you're actually using cell cycle activation and inhibition. And the amount of improvement, this is you truly are seeing regeneration with this approach. And this is a fate-based mapping, so this is a pretty large paper, but it truly changes the way of most cardiac regeneration now. The, of course, the problem is off-target. So in the animals, they didn't have off-target effects. It'll be interesting to see when they like to translate this, because these drugs are not truly cardiac specific, but in the model that they used, it was impressive to see this amount of change because 
what you're transitioning is not only the cardiac myocytes, but the endothelial cells, fibroblasts. You're taking them from that less than 1% cell cycle turnover and popping it up to almost about 30%. So you're almost making it as active in terms of cell turnover as a liver. And so this is impressive. It'll be great to see how many of these groups translate this, but these are basically the cyclin-dependent kinases, or basically you're activating the cell cycle. And so, and it's all transient because it's just drug-based. So you put it in, take it, and it takes processes, it's out of your system in less than a week. And you still see the ad lasting effect. The other approach has been basically taking the IPS model, but then specifically using it for cardiac, where you take three or four genes and basically reprogram cardiac fibroblasts. It's been done ex vivo, but now actually there's in vivo approaches. There's a number of groups doing this, and you actually do see true regeneration of cardiac myocytes. But again, as we saw, there's only about 15 plus percent up to 20 of fibroblasts in the heart. And when transfection efficiency usually is under 30 percent, that this is a very small population that you're actually going to be affected. So you will create new cardiac myocytes, so it is regeneration. But in terms of actual clinical benefit, you're not going to see the same effect as we saw in that previous study where you can actually bump cell cycle up by about 30 percent. But still interesting, very complex. And Right now, this is in large animals currently, but the data does look good that you can regenerate. Fate-based mapping, MRI, very reproducible stuff of regeneration. When we look at just straight gene-based therapies, and this is using uh, CIRCA-2A, so basically cancel calcium handling using AAV1. This is the largest published trial in heart failure, so it's greater than 200 patients, prospective, randomized, blinded, AAV1, CIRCA-2A, one times to the 10 to the 13th particles, and intracoronary. So basically, you're infecting the endothelium. This trial, basically at one year, showed no benefit. And the, mo the largest problem is there's nothing wrong with CIRCA-2A. The science is very solid. It's the delivery. At least half the US population has preformed antibodies to AAV1. So you already take that out. So they screen for that. But despite that, you still see a T cell response to many of these AAV variants in the cardiac model. And so even when you have the right gene, because your construct delivery and other approaches are not ideal, you can make it all the way to a large phase 2B trial and still have negative results, even though the science was very promising. So there's nothing wrong with CIRCA-2A. It basically came a translational problem. Wrong delivery vector and still immune issues, which is the problem with many of cardiac uh, gene-based therapies. So our team's approach was, well, there's so many of these different approaches, and this is a busy slide on purpose, but we basically took all the bone marrow MSCs, our umbilical cord, cardiac IPS, and then compared it to three common genes that are used in most uh, gene-based cardiac therapy, and just put them all head to head. Infarc model, follow it, imaging, hemodynamics, scar remodeling. And what we're able to show is we compared fibrosis, ejection fraction, and actually just true fibrosis all the way across. And what we found is that the umbilical cord cells had the greatest impact on fibrosis. But when you looked at contractility, it was the IPS followed by the S100. So we were actually able to show head to head that depending on the cell type, you actually did have different effects. And we, this is long paper in terms of that. These are the highlights. That head to head, depending on what part of regeneration you're looking at, whether it's scar remodeling, myocyte enhancement, contractility, immune function, you'd need a different biologic. So you have to have potentially a multi-hit approach. And that's the only way we're going to see success with this expecting just one thing, unless you can make your cell in vitro defined of what mechanism you're going after in the heart, that's likely the only way you're going to see a cell-based approach be successful. In a gene-based approach, the only way we see a gene-based approach is to be realistic is if you're going to do multi-target. And so that was one of our lab's biggest goals for the past four years is, can we actually develop a single construct that has multiple genes in it? So our goal was to go after angiogenesis, calcium handling, and cell homing. 
So we actually took three multi-effector genes, put them into one construct, and have translated it now through over 100 pigs that we've infarcted. And last week, we actually treated the first patient here in the US using this retrograde uh, delivery. So this is basically now taking this multi-hit approach, just like we're looking at cells and everything else, that any one of these genes can do something positive. But because heart failure and cardiac regeneration is so complex, you need to have multiple hits going at the same time. So this is a non-viral based approach. We have the ability to redose, and it's uh, thus far has been safe, no arrhythmias in the preclinical model. But this is thus far the first time we know that the FDA has allowed three genes to go into humans at the same time. And it's great our last speaker brought up LVADs. So the safety of this trial is all of these are LVAD patients. But the key is to address the immune system. So we don't put the biologic in when we're putting the LVAD in and the patient's at an extremely high inflammatory state. We wait till they're outpatients. So they're doing well with their LVAD, very stable. They just come in the morning get the 20 minute therapy, stay for safety, and then they go home. And so that way we could really let the biologic do what they're going to do. And we see about a 30% uh, uptake, at least in our preclinical models, using this retrograde delivery approach. But so when we look at cardiac regeneration, there's lots of data out there to say why things don't work. But when you look at it mechanistically, you're like, this makes sense why most of these things didn't work. And it's not that we have this magical gift with a lot of the people we work with, but it's taken 20 years to figure out why most of these things don't work. And it's really been only the last three or four where not only our group, but many groups are actually developing meaningful therapies that at the end of the day have to have clinical benefit. So reduction in death, reduction in readmissions. If you can't do that, it doesn't matter how many EFs you improve or ejection fractions or how many biomarkers you improve. At best, it's only a signal and it's never gonna be a therapeutic that's ever gonna be approved anywhere. So in summary, heart disease, it's, it's increasing everywhere. We just come up with better drugs to basically kick the age another five or 10 years, whether it's drugs, stents, devices. But these advanced regenerative therapies, both for, to treat the structural and biological problems, they continue to improve. You can see there's lots of groups doing it, and we've learned from all the mistakes that have been out there. But defining multi-effector approaches, that's really what's required. So whether, our, I hope we'll see what our approach is, but truly this multi-gene approach, multi-cell approach, or a defined cell that actually has some real mechanisms, that looks like what's at least gonna be the next five to 10 years, or the cell-free approach. So overall, Lots of potential with cardiac regeneration, lots of new therapies out there. So we'll see which ones uh, lead us for the next five to 10 years. Thank you. So uh, plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Uh, my question in the uh, setting of uh, potential use and multi-effector uh, approach, and it does make a lot of sense, the body physiology is pretty complex. Um, is, is there any logic to actually match uh, these allogeneic cells uh, to improve their persistence or to avert um, immune response? That's a great question. There's actually two clinical trials where they've made uh, between three and five master cell banks. And then based on donor blood, they try to optimize which one of the allo cell banks are going to be used for that patient. So it does make sense that allo is not truly allo, as we know both uh, from uh, MHC one and two, but they are trying to optimize it. So there are two trials that currently do that. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about retrograde approach. Um, with the cells, do you, do you get leakage? And where do these cells go? So you actually balloon occlude the coronary sinus. Yeah. And so the pressure pushes the cells in. If you overpressurize the venous system, your body's innate response is that the BCN system. So that way you will actually drain into the right atrium and they all will go to the lung. And what happens to these cells when they go to the lung? Then you see all the great things the, the, from our last speaker's talk. <laughs> so basically, none of the cells survive more than 30 days. 
So that's why for a lot of the initial lung trials, you saw improvement in heart function, and all they were doing is basically decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance so people's right ventricles look better. So you do see a transient release of nitric oxide, and people's heart failure does feel better short term. Hello. I have two questions. Um, one is regarding um, when you mentioned true regeneration of the heart and um, how, how, important, how important it is and how there's now evidence of it in certain therapies. So what are the evidence for cardiomyocyte regeneration? So when you see new cardiomyocytes as opposed to, say, something like where you have a reduced infarct size, but maybe it's from protecting, protective mechanisms? And so, then I have another question after that. Sure. So preclinically, you can either label the cells or do fate-based mapping to see true regeneration. And there are certain markers like PHH3, which actually show uh, cardiac myocyte mitosis or cell division. So for preclinical work, there are lots of ways to define true regeneration. In patients, it's based on MRI. Right now is your only way to see it. And so it's a still indirect way if you're reducing scar are you actually improving myocytes but in patients there is not a direct way to measure regeneration and then um, my second question was regarding your plasma DNA um, gene therapy groups have you considered measuring gene expression for those and then seeing what the protein levels actually are and what are um, uh, what effective protein levels you would have or you would want to have and then also, um, have you considered other ways of enhancing gene expression? Because obviously, uh, plasma DNA itself is not a very uh, efficient gene transfer mechanism. So good questions on all of them. So we actually did have to show when we had the multi-gene, what is the best order of the genes? How do you get fully functional human proteins, not fusion proteins, and actually expression? both in vitro and in vivo in the small and actual large animal model to show what was a therapeutic effect. And then we actually used healthy human IPS and two forms of diseased IPS to actually show contractility. And based on those cells, when we saw a positive effect, then actually looked at the protein expression. And that entire data set of about 1,500 pages was used to get the clinical trial approved. But the second part of that, the pDNA. So we've looked at enhancing pDNA. So right now we're about 30%. And part of it was we saw the therapeutic effect at about 30%. So that's what helped us move into the clinic. But so by no means, we have better ways to deliver than retrograde. This was sort of the first generation to get multi-gene therapy into the clinic. But there's a lot better ways of improving efficiency of transfection and also safety of delivery. Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps my question goes a little bit of a different direction. Um, in my experience working with uh, mesenchymal still stem cells, particularly in cardiac, I see a lot more is done in South America than is actually done in the U.S. And I've noticed, uh, certainly from the IRB side, some hesitations. They go to bone marrow-derived cells and try to extrapolate that to any approach uh, that you might take, and maybe a similar experience, I would say, in regulatory reviewers looking at data as well. Could you talk about your experience and challenges that maybe reviewers like the ethics or even regulatory reviewers have raised as you go into testing these different types of approaches? So it's a great question. I'm probably the worst person to ask. <laughs> and the reason why I'll tell you that is mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate over the past 20 years that this IND for triple gene got approved within 30 days. And I mean, so and from designing the construct on a piece of paper to going into patients was three and a half years. So it's one of those things. So, and even South America versus here, if anything in the last three years, the regulations in South America are much more rigid than the US. So in the US, if you have good science, the FDA is very reasonable for everything we've done. That if you have a reasonable plan, reasonable data, and all the safety components built into it, Phase one trials are relatively easy if the, good, if the data is good, and that's the key here. And so outside the US, there's always ups or downs or fluctuations which way if they're over-regulated or under, mm 
but I've done work pretty much on most continents, and it's a, sometimes it just depends on what year it is. We've had certain things that get approved in Europe before here. I could tell you in the last two and a half years, the most efficient place to get an approval is in the US for especially these complex therapeutics. Mm -hmm. It's not even close compared to the rest of the world. For anything that is officially regulated by an IRB, by a government, hands down, US is the most efficient way to get things done right now. Thank you for the perspectives. Thank you. Um, I had to have your opinion on the um, the level of maturation, particularly cardiomyocyte maturation, that can be achieved with the different approaches you mentioned, and um, how this will influence like future developments into the clinic. Okay, so that's a great question because a lot of people like using cardiac progenitors, whether they're C kit or the old days, everyone thought ISL1 would be the magic cell and you found out it's only available in fetal myocytes. Once they mature to real cardiac myocytes, that marker is not there, so it's no longer a progenitor. So most of these cell types that are true progenitors or myocytes are very early in terms of fetal development. So when you look at their calcium handling and true chronotactility, it's just not there. So unless you have the supporting cells, whether it's fibroblasts or other things, so things sometimes like cardiospheres where you're adding the other supporting cells of endothelial cells, fibroblasts, will help them mature. The problem has been with cardiospheres because it's a big ball. Unless you're opening someone's chest, you actually can't inject them and put them into the heart because all catheter and other based approaches get clogged. So in order to have cell maturation, you need a lot of other supporting cells, and that's why most of the progenitor-based cardiac therapies, usually you don't see any functional benefit. Thank you. Yes? So I was curious. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. You had, you had talked about the AAD1 uh, circuit 2A. Correct. Uh, from the preclinical data and the science was very strong, but it was sort of an implementation problem there. Correct. Is that going to be, is that also going to be the case with viral-based gene therapies for some of the, for some Mendelian disorders? So for example, um, I know there's a CPVT, a company working on CPVT, AAD-based therapy. Uh, for some of the intractable long QT and things like that, aren't isn't the isn't the slow turnover of cardiac cells sort of an advantage for those types of therapies? And do you think we'll get there for viral-based therapies or, or no? So what you're saying is very correct that it is slow cell turnover. So you will get transfection in a small number of cells. But what happens is in the short amount of time that you have most of these AAVs circulating, it's your own immune system actually starts attacking them before you see therapeutic effects. So what you're seeing is you're needing very large doses to potentially see the therapeutic effect. So for a specific single point mutation type problems, you do see some therapeutic benefit, and the reason is because you don't need a complete correction of the disorder. For many of these cardiac disorders, if you have a 5 to 10 percent change in the resident cells to actually get the correct gene, you will actually see the therapeutic effect, especially for EPR, electrophysiological-based disorders. But the problem is still there is if you do get the positive effect once, that construct, that virus, can't use again because you usually have... What you need to use it again is post-mitotic cells. Surprisingly, you still do. That's the whole thing is they are post-mitotic, but whatever the disease was, unless you're correcting it in a pediatric population, which is where some of these are, that's where you do see the greatest potential for the point mutation cardiac gene therapies is peds population, very different population than end-stage heart failure. And I think that's why many groups... Yeah, and that's why that has the greatest potential of viral gene, switch it out, and you'll see something meaningful for those patients. So uh, one last question. In the, the this is all uh, wonderful stuff, and, and it, it's really fascinating to see the different directions. In the work with the cell cycle regulation, that seemed to be very promising. Um, you may mention this, but what are the safeguards? There aren't real any right now. That, that, that's the big issue is that's why it looks so beautiful 
because you're just revving you all the cells at the same time. So no tumors yeah. because it's not a constitutive expression. You're not making a gene. This is straight drug-based. So your auto-regulation still calms it back down. But off-target, at least for the small animals that's been published so far, they didn't have any off-target effects. So it'll be interesting to see when they go to large animal what happens because it's not like these are not cardiac specific. They're cardiotrophic, but not specific. Mm 